If you've ever used a card to pay for something, you're definitely familiar with the names American Express, Visa, and MasterCard. These three have dominated the card processing industry for decades, but most people don't know the difference between them. And frankly, there is very little difference between them from the consumer side if you're not keen on maximizing credit card points and rewards. However, from the business side, American Express is radically different from the other two. American Express is not the most common card by any means. In fact, Visa and MasterCard destroy Amex in terms of issued cards. For example, Visa has 343 million credit cards in circulation within the US and 798 million credit cards in circulation outside the US. Similarly, MasterCard has 249 million credit cards in the US and 725 million credit cards outside the US. This means that Visa has a total of 1.14 billion credit cards in circulation and MasterCard has 974 million cards. Meanwhile, Amex only has 53.8 million credit cards in the US and 58.2 million credit cards outside the US or just 112 million cards in total. This means that Visa and MasterCard have issued 20 times as many cards as Amex. At first, this looks really bad for Amex until you take a look at their revenue numbers. In the last 12-month period, Visa pulled in $24.1 billion in revenue and MasterCard pulled in $17.8 billion in revenue. Together, this adds up to $41.9 billion. Meanwhile, Amex pulled in $41 billion in revenue by themselves. Now, this isn't an exact science or anything, but if we divide each of their revenues by the number of cards in circulation, we'll see that each Amex customer is worth $366 in revenue. In contrast, each Visa customer is only worth $21 and each MasterCard customer is only worth $18. Now, this already paints a terrible picture for Visa and MasterCard, but we haven't even considered the elephant in the room. Here's the thing, Amex doesn't really deal with debit cards, so the vast majority of their revenue truly comes from just credit cards. The same, however, cannot be said about the other two. Visa and MasterCard are heavily involved in the debit card game. Visa has a total of 2.4 billion debit cards in circulation, and MasterCard has 1.4 billion debit cards in circulation. So really, each issued card is worth less than $10 in annual revenue for Visa and MasterCard meaning that each Amex customer is 36 times as valuable. So, here's how Amex became the king of credit cards and why high spenders far prefer Amex over Visa and MasterCard. Taking a look back, Amex wasn't always the high-ticket closer that they are today. In fact, they weren't even a financial business, they were originally a shipping business. It all started on March 18, 1850, when three men named Henry Wells, William Fargo, and John Butterfield decided to join forces. Together, these guys owned three shipping businesses that they had been running for a few years. The first company was called Livingston, Fargo & Co. and was founded in 1845 by Henry and William. The second company was called Wells & Co. and was founded in 1846 by Henry. And finally, the third company was called Butterfield & Wasson and was founded in 1849 by John Butterfield and James Wasson. At the time, railroads were a rather new invention and the demand for sending shipments was growing rapidly. Instead of competing against each other and seeing who came out on top though, the trio decided to combine their efforts and form a small monopoly within New York called American Express. The company mainly focused on shipping goods between New York City and Buffalo, but they also had some destinations throughout the Midwest as well. This proved to be an extremely profitable regional business, but neither Henry nor William were satisfied with just this market. You see, these two wanted to build a national business, so they wanted to expand to California and capitalize on the gold rush. However, the other board members would not approve this expansion effort. Henry and William weren't willing to give up this opportunity though, so they would start a new express and financial services business in California in 1852. I think it's safe to say that Amex messed up pretty big here given that the new business was Wells Fargo. Nonetheless, things were going well for Amex as well. They were expanding into the money order business and their monopoly was still intact up until 1866 when they saw their first major competitor called Merchants Union Express Company. Amex and Merchants Union fought fiercely for market share over the next two years. But in 1868, they decided to simply join forces and create American Merchants Union Express Company. Honestly, that's quite a long and cumbersome name. But fortunately, they would shrink the name back to American Express in 1873. They had successfully avoided a long-term clash with Merchants Union. But this fiasco made them realize the importance of diversification. And with that, Amex would start to explore new paths throughout the next few decades. Amex started off by thinking of new ways they could build customer loyalty and provide more value. 
Many of Amex's customers were small local businesses that were using Amex to source their goods. These local businesses didn't have the resources to constantly travel to their suppliers and negotiate better prices. But Amex already had agents all over the place. So in 1878, Amex started negotiating with suppliers on behalf of their clients, and this has turned into one of the trademarks of Amex today. Of course, they're no longer negotiating purchase orders. Instead, they're negotiating for high demand items and experiences. No one knows exactly how Amex pulls it off, but if you're a platinum card holder, or better yet, a centurion card holder, Amex can get you anything you want, whether that be front row seats to a Lakers game or an invitation to Justin Bieber's wedding. Anyway, going back to the 1870s, this new negotiation service was a massive hit with customers, and Amex would follow up this success with a traveler's check in 1891. If you're not familiar with what a traveler's check is, it's basically just a safer way to carry money with you while you're traveling. Instead of carrying cash, you carry a traveler's check and redeem it for money when you arrive at your destination. This was particularly appealing to international travelers who regularly traveled to Europe. This transformed Amex into an international business and they would open offices in England, Germany, and Paris. Soon after, World War I rolled around and Amex would score a deal with the British government. Amex was contracted to deliver letters, money, and relief packages to British prisoners throughout the war. And by the end of the war, Amex was delivering 150 tons of parcels every single day to just prisoners. It looked like things couldn't get any better, but then the American government would screw over Amex. Throughout the winter of 1917, the US would experience a massive coal shortage, which meant that it became extremely expensive to ship items across the US. This wasn't optimal for Amex, but given that shipping rates had gone up across the board, Amex didn't really have to worry about losing customers to competitors. They did, however, have to worry about the government. On December 26, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson ordered the railroads to help in the war effort by helping them move troops, supplies, and coal. And all contracts between railroad companies and express companies were nullified. While this was an unfortunate turn of events, Amex couldn't really complain, given that the decision was made for a much more important cause. Wilson's next decision, however, was definitely something worth complaining about. Treasury Secretary William McAdoo proposed the idea of consolidating all existing express companies into a nationalized company. President Wilson approved this proposal, and with that, Amex lost their express business. All express companies were hurt, but Amex was hurt the most given that they were the biggest company. They lost 10,000 offices, 30,000 employees, and their rights to 71,000 miles of railroad. The new nationalized company was called American Railway Express Agency, and though the US would return ownership to the private companies in 1920, it would never be the same. Amex had lost everything that was unique to them. They had given up a highly respected personalized express service, and in return, they basically got a 40% stake in USPS, and no one likes USPS. In 1929, the assets and operations of American Railway Express would be transferred to Railway Express Agency, and that was basically the end of this business. The company declined for decades until it finally filed for bankruptcy in 1975. I guess it was a good thing that Amex sort of diversified into traveler's checks, but this didn't help much. For the US, the Great Winter only lasted a couple of months, but for Amex, it would end up lasting 41 years until they stumbled upon credit cards. Amex had considered the possibility of launching a credit card as early as 1946, but it wasn't until the launch and success of the Diners Club card that Amex decided to take the plunge. At the end of 1957, Amex announced that they were going to enter the credit card business. From the very beginning, Amex was set on targeting the premium market and capturing high spenders. They charged an annual fee of $6, which was $1 more than the Diners Club's $5 fee. Amex figured that this would make their cards seem more exclusive and desirable, and they were completely right given the massive demand that followed. By the time the official launch happened in October of 1958, Amex had already issued 250,000 cards. Initially, the cards were printed on paper, but in 1959, Amex introduced plastic cards with embossed numbers. Similar to how everyone wants a metal card today, back in 1959, everyone wanted Amex's new plastic card. Amex further built on this exclusive image with the gold card in 1966 and the platinum card in 1984. The platinum card was invite only, and Amex only picked the highest spenders with the best payment histories. Aside from being hard to qualify for, the platinum card carried a hefty annual fee of $250, which has since grown to $695. And to persuade people to pay these hefty fees, Amex introduced the famous Membership Rewards program in 1991. Within just 10 years, Membership Rewards became the world's largest card-based rewards program, and Amex has held this title ever since. Aside from building an exclusive image amongst customers, Amex was concurrently building exclusive relationships with merchants. 
They offered lower merchant fees to restaurants and businesses if they exclusively accepted American Express. This worked pretty well between 1981 and 1991, but a group of merchants would start to rebel against Amex in 1991. Instead of exclusively accepting Amex, they started to exclusively accept Visa and MasterCard. And with that, Amex would back off with their exclusivity deals, but they would never give up their exclusive image. Even today, exclusivity is the name of the game when it comes to Amex because their business model is radically different from the rest of the industry. Most credit card companies make their money on the high interest rates they charge. And given that 55% of Americans carry a credit card balance, this is quite profitable. But this model would never work for Amex because they only issue cards to customers with excellent credit. And the thing is, people with excellent credit don't carry balances. Amex is well aware of this, and this is why many of their cards don't even allow customers to carry a balance. The Amex Green Card, Gold Card, Platinum Card, and Centurion Card are all charge cards, which means that you have to pay your balance in full every month. Amex has become more lenient over the past few years, and they have introduced workarounds that allow you to sort of carry a balance, but this is by no means their focus. In that case, you might think that their annual fees are their focus. Amex cards often carry annual fees in the hundreds of dollars and even thousands of dollars. But while this pulls in a lot of revenue, it's not super lucrative. You know, sourcing tickets to Justin Bieber's wedding and giving customers access to Centurion airport lounges aren't exactly cheap. And given that their customers are smart spenders, most of them are not going to pay a $5,000 annual fee unless they're confident they can milk $6,000 worth of value. But then, why does Amex spend so many resources on what seems like a zero-sum or even negative-sum service? Well, the answer is that you are their partner, and they're willing to go to extreme lengths to keep you happy and loyal. You see, the key to Amex's business is not high interest rates or high annual fees. The key is the high fees they charge merchants. Visa and MasterCard only charge 1.25% to 2.5% per transaction, but American Express charges 1.5% to 3.5% per transaction. This may not sound like much, but an extra 1% on every transaction adds up super fast. Because of this, most merchants aren't a fan of Amex. But they're forced to accept Amex because all the high spenders prefer to use Amex. And this creates a super unique business dynamic. Visa and MasterCard partner with retailers to try to get you to spend as much money as possible and pay as much interest as possible. Meanwhile, Amex partners with you to try to get as many retailers to accept their high fees as possible. And so far, they've been extremely successful at this, given that 99% of US merchants who accept a credit card also accept American Express. So how about we keep up the streak and continue supporting Amex? Do you guys have an Amex card? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you're a fan of Amex's business model. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.